So, what are we going to talk about today? Culture, values, and leadership. I'm going to show you a method for measuring culture by mapping values. I'm going to talk about uh, leadership, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, building sustainable cultures, not just in organizations, but also briefly, I'm going to talk about nations. So there's a lot to talk about. Uh, let me get underway, and I'm hoping that I'll have uh, enough time to answer your questions. If you have a burning question as we move forward, please raise your hand. If I don't see you, stand up. And if I don't catch, if you haven't caught my attention by then, you're quite allowed to shout at me. <laughs> okay? Right, so let's get going. Um, I presume this works by clicking. We're going to talk at the beginning where pretty much um, where we just left off. Whole system change. How do you create change in a, uh, in a culture? And basically, uh, I want to talk about Ken Wilber's four quadrants. Anybody heard of Ken Wilber's four quadrants? Oh, a few of you. Okay. Well, basically, what Ken Wilber was saying is that any human system can be defined, or all human knowledge can be defined in four ways. Um, here we have the interior of the individual, the exterior of the individual, the interior of the collective, and the exterior of the collective. Think about it. So if you're talking about a nation or an organization, there's an internal part. Um, of the organization, but there's also an internal part of you, and there's an external part of you, and there's an external part of the organization. And so, if you want whole system change, all of these things have to change at the same time, otherwise it doesn't work. In order for all of this to work and for whole system change to take place, what happens is, what's, the way that change happens is it starts with the leaders of the organization who have a shift in values, what Giovanna was just talking about shift in mindsets. That leads to a change in their behavior. As the leaders change their behavior, the employees see that change. That becomes a change in the values of the culture, and then the behaviors of the culture change. That's how transformation happens. That's the process. So working with the leaders is absolutely essential for whole system change. When the leaders' values change, the there's behaviors change. When the leader's behavior change, the values of the organization change, and then the behaviors of the organization change. Now, what this leads to is four conditions for whole system change. Now, at the top level, we've got personal alignment. So what we're looking for is authentic leaders who may be talking about values, but they're also living their values. And as coaches, or as people working in organizations, doing transformation, part of your job is to help leaders build that sense of authenticity. And if you really want to understand uh, what uh, authenticity means and want to read about it in an organizational context, I, I encourage you to read Bill George's book. Bill George, um, True North, uh, was the leader of Medtronic for many years. I, I met him for the first time just a couple of weeks ago in America. And, and True North is about authentic leadership. So this is about leaders walking the talk. Now, at the bottom of this uh, four conditions is what I call structural alignment. Now, it's the same thing, but at a cultural level. So if your organization says, oh, we're, we have these values, teamwork, uh, commitment, uh, customer satisfaction, it means that those values have to be embedded in every system and process Every incentive has to align with those values. So an organization, for example, that says, oh yes, we espouse teamwork, but rewards individuals rather than teams is not in structural alignment, you see? It's, it's like me saying, you know, I, you, it's like me being out of alignment saying, you know, I, I trust you, I tr totally trust you, and then I'm checking up behind all the time to know that you did the job, okay? So it's the same thing at the level of the organization. So, embedding the values in every system and process. And this has a lot of, got a lot to do with HR, but it's also got a lot to do with all of the processes that uh, the organizations use. Now, on the left-hand side, as you look at this, this is the internal of the individual and uh, the internal of the collective. We have something called 
uh, values alignment. Have any of you ever worked, worked in an organization where you felt your values didn't align with the values of the organization? Anybody done that? Let's see a show of hands. Yeah. Well, it's pretty commonplace. You know, you work there and you think, got it. I hate the values. Uh, my stepson, Chris, uh, he, after three years in his, uh, uh, of working, he was an IT consultant. He came, I'd just started my company, and uh, he came to me and said, you know, I'm leaving my company. I said, why? He said, because I don't like their values. Right? And so the alignment of personal values with the values of the organization is absolutely essential because what it does, together with mission alignment, which I'll in a minute, is it, it allows people to connect into that discretionary energy that good, help, helps them go the extra mile for the organization. And that's what really makes a successful organization. So mission alignment is when you believe that the organization is on the right track and not only that, that your contribution, you can see how it relates to the vision and mission of the organization. That's mission alignment. So when you get values alignment and mission alignment, you get a huge amount of employee engagement and you get all that discretionary energy that goes with that to help make the company a great company. And there are plenty of models of those companies around. So these are the four conditions for whole system change. Now, interestingly, in Tom Peters, In Search of Excellence, 1983, he said this. The real role of the leader is to manage the values of the corporation. How many of our leaders know that? <laughs> yeah, they don't know it. They don't even know how to manage their own values. So leading self is the first stage of being able to manage the values of the organization. If you can't manage your own values, how can you manage the values of a team? How can you manage the values of an organization? Impossible. So, how do you know if you're being successful driving whole system change? Well, things. First of all, you need to measure the consciousness of the leaders. Oh, the consciousness of the leaders? How the heck do you do that? I'm going to show you how to do that. Then you need to say, Measure the consciousness of the organization as perceived by the employees. Is there values alignment? Is there mission alignment? And thirdly, measure the consciousness of the organization as perceived by customers and society. So we're talking about a 360 look at the organization, internal and external, are the values of the organization in alignment with society, employees, customers, shareholders, suppliers, because when you get that alignment, you get high performance systems, high performance processes, and a high performance organization. Now, I prepared this slide for a talk that I gave um, two weeks ago at the Conscious Capitalism Conference in Boston. Now, anybody heard of Conscious Capitalism? Okay, well, I'm being evangelistic today. <laughs> Conscious Capitalism Institute, look it up. It is the next big trend. It is huge. Because at the core of Conscious Capitalism is, the, is a book called Firms of Endearment. F-I-R-M-S of Endearment. And what they show in that, I don't know whether I've got the slide, maybe I have, I can't remember. <laughs> But it shows that the success, financial success of these companies over the long term outperforms just about any index you care to name. And what are the tenets of conscious capitalism? What are the principles of conscious capitalism? Here they are. At the center, they're values driven. And then these organizations have a higher purpose, a purpose beyond profit that focuses on society. Also, they have stakeholder integration, and they consider all stakeholders in all their decisions. When I say all stakeholders, I'm talking about the customers, the employees, the shareholders, the local community, society, and their suppliers. Everybody is considered when decision-making is made. 
I mean, some companies don't do that. There was a very good example in America recently uh, where this uh, Netflix, I don't know whether you've heard of Netflix, you, you, rent a, you rent a movie and they send it to you in the post and, uh, and then when you finish, you send it back. And they, they, they unilaterally made the decision, they weren't going to do that anymore, they were going to stream videos, you could go online and stream. And the market value crashed because nobody wanted that. They really weren't in tune with their customers. So it's really important if you're living and working in society today to consider all stakeholders. Now, the other two tenets of conscious capitalism are conscious leadership and conscious culture. Now, when I was at the conference there, I said, look, okay, so if you want to do conscious capitalism, you better be able to measure your conscious the consciousness of the leaders and the consciousness of the culture. And guess what? That's what we do. And we've been doing it for 15 years, and I'm going to show you how we do that. We have over here what we call the Cultural Values Assessment, for short, cult CVA. And on the right-hand side, we have what's known as the Leadership Values Assessment, the LVA. My three mantras of organizational performance, which I wrote about in Liberating the Corporate Soul, are as follows. Mantra number one, cultural capital is a new frontier of competitive advantage. Who you are and what your organization stands for is vitally important. You have to have a focus on vision, mission, and values, and a vision and mission which is more than just making money. Secondly, culture of an organization is a reflection of leadership consciousness. Organizational transformation begins with the personal transformation of the leaders. It begins with self-leadership. If you can't lead yourself, how are you ever going to lead a team or an organization? And measurement matters. If you can measure consciousness, you can manage it, and you can make the evolution of consciousness conscious. Think about that for a moment. The first time in the evolutionary history we can actually make the evolution of consciousness conscious. Because we can measure it, we can see where we are, and we can see what's next. Up to this point in time, human evolution has been haphazard. It has been following a pattern, but the pattern has really been lost in the chaos. So what I'm going to show you is, what is that pattern? The pattern of evolution. And uh, I've spent many years uh, researching that. And I will explain it to you. But what I realize is this pattern of evolution, which is true for every human being, is also true for every human culture and every nation. It's the same pattern. And it's the same pattern that you find in the evolution of atoms into cells and cells into organisms and organisms into creatures. And having realize that there are three universal stages of evolution, I began to say, well, maybe if we understand those patterns of evolution, we can consciously create the world that we want. And so in my latest book, which is just finished, it's uh, already available in an e-book and will be available in a paperback soon, is Love, Fear, and the Destiny of Nations, The Impact of the Evolution of Human Consciousness on World Affairs, where I lay out this evolutionary pattern and I show what this evolutionary pattern tells us about the evolution of nations. It's a fascinating story because basically, I don't know whether you are students of evolution, but evolution is happening before our very eyes. The Euro crisis right now, the whole European Union, it's evolution in action. It is so fascinating, it's so much fun. It's beautiful. Did you say it's beautiful? No, I said it's, it's fearful as well. It's fearful. Don't buy into it. As soon as you enter into fear, you're part of the problem. Oh, I know, I'm not the... It is fearful. If you buy into fear, you're part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. Think about that. If you buy into fear, you're part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. Because what's happening right now is things are crumbling. Whoa, hooray. Because things have to change. We have to, new to move to those new mindsets that we were talking about earlier if we're going to live in a sustainable future. Which means that the old leadership mindsets are no longer appropriate. 
because they don't look at. They look at what's in it for me instead of what's best for the common good. Being the best in the world rather than the best for the world. That's the shift. And guess what? <laughs> We've got a room full of people who are going to do it. It's you. You're going to help people do that. That's, that's why you showed up today. Did you know that? Quite a responsibility you have, right? But that's what's in your hearts. That's why you're here today. That's your passion. Time to step up. Make it happen. Become the best version of you that you can become. Because that passion that lies inside of you, that has brought you here, because you want to bring transformation to the world, that part of you is your soul crying out for oneness. Your soul crying out, we need a better world. Time to become the servant of your soul. Because that is what your passion is about. And if you let your ego needs get in the way, fear crops up, man, you're going to miss the bus. Okay, let's move on. Okay, how do you measure an organizational culture? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, you don't need that publicity. Here we go. Uh, the model is originally based on a Maslow's hierarchy with a, a little bit of difference. So Maslow defined uh, human needs, uh, deficiency needs, uh, physiological needs, that's the needs of the body, safety, love and belonging, self-esteem. He said, we don't gain any sense of lasting satisfaction if we're able to meet these needs, but we feel anxious and fearful if we can't. And then once we've begun to satisfy those deficiency needs, we move on to satisfying our growth needs. And these are this, this shift from ego to soul. He didn't say that, I just said that. But that's what I think he meant. When these needs are fulfilled, they don't go away. You want to do more and more of it because it fills you with joy, inner joy. Whereas uh, those lower needs, those efficiency needs, what we get is a sense of happiness when those needs are met. But when we've met them, you know, we put food on the table, our kids have had an education, I've reached a good status in my work, and what's next? Suddenly we're no longer happy, and we have to turn inside for true happiness, for true joy, and let our souls sing. Because that's where we find joy. That's when we find our sense of life, when we want to make a difference, and when making a difference becomes a way of life, we enter into the realm of service, service to humanity, service to the planet. Anyhow, so I took these uh, needs and I translated it into consciousness. I expanded Maslow's uh, self-actualization into three levels of consciousness, which I'll describe in a moment. So I expanded self-actualization, I substituted hierarchy of needs for states of consciousness and built this model. And then out of this model, I created a tool. So here's the seven levels of personal consciousness, now, in these first three levels, which I'll describe together, there's a positive focus and there's a potentially negative focus, um, which I'll explain. So, at this first level, it's about meeting our survival needs. I mean, everybody needs to meet, our, meet their survival needs, um, and otherwise they're just going to die and perish. So, it's creating a safe and secure environment for ourselves and our significant others. At the second level, Having satisfied that need for security and safety, we move to satisfy our need for love and belonging. And then thirdly, we move forward into satisfying our need for a sense of pride in who we are and self-worth in our performance. Now, if you have any fear-based subconscious beliefs at any of these levels, and we all do, um, they show up as limiting values. At the first level, we show up as control and greed. At the second level, we show up as being like, wanting to be liked and blaming others in order to, we blame others so that people will like us. Um, and then we, or the, people, the power authority in our life will like us. And then there's power, status, and hierarchy. So these are what we call potentially limiting values. Now, we develop these subconscious fear-based beliefs during the six, first six or seven years of our lives uh, when our, um, uh, we have our uh, 
reptilian brain in place when we're born and we have our limbic brain in place when we're born, but we don't have our neocortex in place because uh, basically the, 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 the canal through which the baby is born is not big enough to allow the head to come through. So our developed brain mind development continues for the first six or seven years, but it means that during that period, we interpret everything that's going on in the world through the reptilian and limbic brain, which is the emotional brain. Oh, it's the emotional parts of our brains. And so children learn how to um, find pleasure and avoid pain uh, through their emo experience of emotions. They don't have the cognitive ability to reason out why this is happening. And that's when you learn these subconscious fear-based beliefs. And everybody grows up with them. I, I, could, you know, I could be with every one of you for like 10 or 15 minutes and we could, everybody would have some form of subconscious fear-based belief because every family is dysfunctional, including your own, because none of us are perfect. However, what is so interesting and gives room for so much optimi optimism and hope is that the generation which is growing up now and perhaps the, the generation for just previous generation are growing up some of them are growing up in families where the parents are self-actualized, have got beyond meeting their efficiency needs, they're already meeting their growth needs, so they're brought up in a much more intelligent way, so they don't have so many subconscious fear-based beliefs at these first three levels of consciousness. At level one, I don't have enough. At level two, I'm not loved enough. And level three, I'm not enough. And so they're, they're expanding their consciousness and accelerating their growth and development faster than you and I ever did at least people from my generation, I'm a little bit older than most people in this room. And so that's great hope for the future because we've got these young people coming along who are already approaching self-actualization in their 20s and 30s. Surely you're seeing some of this in the people you're coaching. So let's move on now to the next stage, which is the transformation level. So this is the level where you begin to understand that you are fear-based beliefs and they're, they're not, they're hindering your performance. And so you decide to name what that fear is, these unconscious fears, and work with it. And that's the work of personal transformation. That's the work of the coaching that you do. And so this enables you to let go of your parental and cultural conditioning. Because up to this point, you're basically operating as an automaton based on your cultural conditioning and your parental conditioning. And this allows you to become free. And what does this? This opens, as you let go of those fears, it opens the space for your soul to manifest and become your unique self. To express who you truly are. To live your own values and not the values of your parents and your culture. Like that guy from Israel. Man, there you go. Beautiful example. A self-individuated act self-actualizing individual who said, hey, enough is enough, this is what I stand for. <coughs> Beautiful example. And this is what happens at this level. We have the fear, we have the courage to overcome our fears and move then to the next level where we find personal meaning in life, where we begin to align the ego needs, deficiency with the soul needs to make a difference in the world, which is the next level, but to find that meaning, that internal meaning that gives us you know, when we wake up in the morning and go to work, we go, wow, what a privilege, because I'm, I'm able to live my passion. That's internal cohesion, when the ego, the, the beliefs of the ego align with the values of the soul. And then the next level is making a difference. Now, what we begin to learn is that we want to actualize our self-sense of meaning by making a difference in the world and to gain leverage we need to align with other people who have a similar sense of purpose because then we can make an even bigger difference. So again, so this is a, you know, exactly why you're all in this room because in this room you are beginning to collaborate with other like-minded people so you can make a bigger difference in the world. It's level six consciousness. And then as you begin to under learn that making a difference is your path to joy, you enter into the level of service because there's nothing else you want to do. And this is truly when you become the servant of your soul, there's nothing else. You give up all your ideas of vision and mission and you say, man, I'm a soul having a human experience and I'm living the life of my soul and my soul is passionate about this and this is what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna get out of the way because the more, as soon as I do, 
synchronicity rains down on you. All manner of unconnected events, or seemingly unconnected, every day your path opens up before you if, it's, if it was normal. And in, in this sense, you have no needs because the needs that you thought you might have in order to move forward with your passion and your career are already met before you even know it. <coughs> because the soul operates at another level of consciousness. Yeah, I wasn't going to do this bit, but I'm going to do this bit now because I'm up, I just got the message to do it, okay? I got the message to do the next thing I'm going to do. So do you know what it's like to operate from that, what I call the fourth dimension of consciousness, the conscious level of the soul? I'm going to explain it to you. Everybody knows that we operate in three-dimensional consciousness. So if we compare what it's like to live in two-dimensional consciousness with three-dimensional consciousness, then compare three to four, we'll get an understanding. So imagine for a moment, living on the surface of this table, are beings of two-dimensional consciousness. They've got length and breadth, they have no idea about height. Okay, so everybody do that, and then do that. Yeah, everybody includes everybody, not just some of you. <laughs> that and that. Okay, now, imagine, that's everybody, uh, you living on the surface of this table are these beings with two-dimensional consciousness. And so, yesterday when they were here, there was nothing. And now, guess what? There's five separate circles. That's a projection from the third dimension into the second dimension of consciousness. And so, these are five separate circles at two-dimensional reality. And so, they, they notice these circles and they say, well, wow, they went here yesterday, but they're here today. Let's call our two-dimensional scientist friends in to look at these circles. And so, it's like crop circles, you know, same sort of idea. And they, and they start moving one of these circles, and then all the other circles follow. And then they move this circle, and then all the other circles follow. And they go, wow, let's draw up a set of equations that explains how the five separate circles work. And they do that. And then they have other scientists come, and they all experiment with the five separate circles, and they come to the same conclusion. They know all there is to know about the five separate circles. But you and I, we know, we're living in three-dimensional reality. These aren't five separate circles. They're totally connected. Get that? That's exactly as we are with the fourth dimension of consciousness, the soul dimension, the quantum reality. We don't see the connectedness because three-dimensionality is a property of our senses. It's not a property of the world. Three-dimensionality is not a property of the world, it's a property of our senses. We live in a multi-dimensional world, we only see a little bit of it. So when you slip into that soul consciousness and follow your passion and live that life, what happens is you invite those synchronicities into your life, which you don't know how they happen, but they're happening, your soul is organizing your life so it can live out its passion in the world. Isn't that beautiful? So that's our job, to help people move forward on that path, move out of those deficiency needs where they're fear-bound and move into the <coughs> upper levels where there are opportunity exists for, to become all you can become. Okay, seven levels of consciousness. I don't usually go into that much detail because usually we're talking in a business environment. I usually keep it much simpler, but since you are the group you are and Giovanna used the word soul earlier. I felt I had permission. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the seven levels of consciousness in an organization. So, at the beginning of the bottom of the organization is basically survival is financial performance. It's about being able to survive in this business world. And if you don't make money, well, guess what? You're not going to survive. The second level is about relationships. It's about loyalty, open communication, customer satisfaction, working with your suppliers. And at the third level, it's about high-performing systems and processes that allow employees to feel a sense of pride when they come to work. Now, these first three levels represent the, level of the, ego, the levels of the ego, and so there is the downside, which um, are the limiting values that show up um, when the leader is operating with some of those dysfunctional beliefs that we talked about earlier. So, Enron is a beautiful example of those dysfunctional beliefs at level one. Greed destroyed the company. So level two 
we get into manipulation and blame. And at level three, we get into bureaucracy, complacency, and those other limiting values that show up at that level. Now, this is, so when you're able to master those fears of the leaders and, and, and master these first three levels of consciousness, I call that personal mastery, we then move to the fourth level of consciousness, which is transformation, which is that level of adaptability, that, again, that Giovanni spoke about, continuous renewal, accountability, adaptability, empowerment, teamwork, etc. Now, notice I'm defining specific words attached to levels of consciousness. Because this is fundamental to the tool, because you'll be able to see. If you can define the values in your organization, you can actually map what levels of consciousness they're operating from. Now we get to the level five, which is that internal cohesion, which is brought on by shared value system and shared vision and shared values. When everybody is in alignment with what we're supposed to be doing and shares the same values of the organization. Level six is when we begin Deepen that sense of internal connectedness through internal coaching, but also expand our sense of external connectedness by making strategic alliances and partners with other like-minded organizations so we can increase our own resilience and our leverage in the world. And finally, level seven, where we begin to realize that the organization is part of society. And also we begin to realize that Society is framed within the environment of the Earth. So that if our environment crashes, our society will crash. If our society will crash, our business will crash also. So at this level, we understand that big picture. And we begin to align the motivations of the organization with the motivations of society and with the needs of the planet, which is our life support system. That's what intelligent organizations are beginning to do. So, the survey is so simple, it takes 15 minutes, we ask three questions. I mean, have you ever done a survey with only three questions? Usually it goes on for pages and pages and takes like 45 minutes or an hour. Okay, well, first of all, the first thing you do is you go in and pick out what, you're doing it for an organization, you can do it for any group of people, it can be a team, an organization, it can be a nation, it can be anything. Uh, you define the demographics, so you say, well, you know, uh, business units, departments, gender, age, etc. So you click on all those boxes, and then you answer these three questions. Which of the following values and behaviors most reflect who you are? Pick ten. Which of the following values and behaviors most reflect how your current organization currently operates? Pick ten. And which of the following values and behaviors most reflect how you'd like your organization to operate? Or values that you think represent a high-performance organization. Now, you pick from a list of 80 or 90 words which are customized for your organization. So if you're in a particular business like hospitals, then it's patient care. If you're in a uh, more regular business, it's customer satisfaction. Or, so it's customized. It's customized in many different ways. I won't go into all those details. So what happens is, let's say here's an example. We take 100 employees. Uh, they've answered the question, pick the 10 values that represent who you are, the personal values, 10 values about your organization operates, so this is what we've got here, and 10 values how you'd like it to operate. So what you've got here is the current culture. And so the number one value out of the 50, 100 people, 59 people said tradition was one of the values of the organization. We call that a potentially limiting value because then it can block innovation. Secondly, diversity, and tradition is a level, limiting level two value. Diversity is a positive level four value. Control is a limiting level one value. And goals orientation is a positive level four value. Uh, profit is a positive level one value. Open communication is a positive level two value. So what you see immediately now, we're beginning to map consciousness because all of these values relate to different levels of consciousness. So what that means is that we can, so this is the map of the top 10 values that these 100 people picked. But if we really want to see the whole picture, what we have to do is, everybody had 10 picks. So there's a, 10 people, 100 people, 10 picks, that's 1,000 votes. We can see the distribution here of all of the votes for all of the values by level of consciousness. And in the red ones, where the ego domain, if you like, these red votes, ones are basically all of the votes for those potentially limiting values 
like blame, hierarchy, status, internal competition, etc. And so we can see, and that gives us a number, when we add up these percentage, because these are the percentage of the votes, a number which we call cultural entropy. Cultural entropy is the amount of dysfunction in the system because it takes energy to do blame, it takes energy to do internal competition. And what we have found is that when that cultural entropy gets beyond 45%, companies tend to go bankrupt or they're taken over because there's so much energy not going into useful activities. And the high-performing companies have entropy below 10%. Uh, and, and we've done you know, thousands of these uh, assessments, so we, we've got this kind of finely tuned now as to what cultural entropy means. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit later, if I have time, you can also measure personal entropy of the leaders using a similar system. So this is what the result looks like. Over on the left-hand side, you've got the top 10 personal values by level. This is 339 people in an engineering company, 169 voted for honesty. In the second column, you've got the current culture. And the white dots are those potentially limiting values. Blame, inconsistency, job insecurity. And over here, you've got the desired culture. So you've got, what are our, these are our top ten personal. This is what we're seeing in the culture, and this is what we'd like to see in the culture. Now... You've got them arranged by number of votes, so you've got uh, the highest scoring votes, and you can see how many matching values. There's only one matching value between the personal and the current, it's accountability. There's four matching values between the current and desired. And there's one matching between desired and personal, it's accountability. And commitment, sorry, there are two. So what this does, it enables us to do a deep dive into the culture of the company. But the real juice lies in pulling this data out for different levels of the organization, different business units. So then we can identify pockets of high entropy in the organization and immediately direct our focus to where that high entropy is. And because that high entropy in a particular business unit is a function of the leader of that unit. And that is a leader who may need coaching. So it's really insightful at understanding what is working and not working, and where it's working and not working in an organization. So this is, I won't go into more detail here, but that's the, the, what we call the dot plot. And this is the distribution of all of the votes. Sorry. On the left-hand side, personal values. In the middle, we've got the distribution of all of the current culture votes with an entropy at 23% which is relatively elevated and is a cause for concern. And on the right-hand side, we've got the desired culture. And what we see here is a big, in the a level four, we have 21% of the votes in personal values. In the current culture, we've got 20%, but in the desired, we have 27. At level five, we've got 11% of the votes in the current at level five and 19% in the design. So we know that this company is really lo not just looking for transformation at level, ten, at level four, they're looking for internal cohesion too, at level five consciousness. So uh, let me just skip this. These are the results of a high performing team known as the Barrett Value Center. Uh, let me just show you this. So one of the things, this is a small team, 18 people. Uh, one of the things we can do, we can, we can say, well, how many votes did a particular value get in the current culture and how many did it get in the desired culture and what are the biggest jumps between the current? This is called a value jump table. This is my own organization. And the biggest jump, and our last time we did this, which was just a few months ago, was people are wanting to see more teamwork from four votes in the current culture to 10 in the desired culture, a jump of six. More customer collaboration. So what this does is it basically gives us a roadmap for moving forward, and we do it every year, and companies do it every year, and they've got a roadmap to move forward. Now, when they follow this roadmap, what happens is employee engagement goes up, income goes up, cultural entropy goes down. Here's the impact of cultural entropy. You have all of these slides, so I don't need to go into detail. Um, 
these, these are the, these are over 1,000 organizations. We plotted the entropy of these 1,000 organizations. Um, we have about 133 of this 1,000 which are operating in the, in the prime, 10% or below. Uh, a, a large proportion operating at level 11% to 20%. What that means is if you look back here, there are 11 to 20 percent minor issues. This is a level of cultural entropy reflects issues requiring cultural and structural adjustment. And then as you get into higher levels of entropy, you get into more and more work with leaders. And at the highest levels, we're even talking about changing leaders. Because, because the, if the leaders are not, not changed, something will happen. So, uh, you know, interestingly, we've been mapping the values of nations. And um, in uh, August uh, 2008, we mapped the values of Iceland. Uh, so we took a statistically valid sample of the population of Iceland. We said, what are your personal values? What values do you see in your nation? What values would you like to see in the nation? And we were really amazed to see cultural entry becoming at 54%. So when I went to Iceland on September the 6th and with our local partner there, um, we were on TV and I said, you know what? If you've got leadership issues and if you were an organization, you'd be going bankrupt about now. Two weeks later, they went bankrupt. And we've got no numerous other examples, similar examples. So, um, let me move on. You don't need to see all of these details. This is an example of what happened in South Africa when Tom Boardman there took over the company in 2003. It was in terrible situation. It was one of the fourth biggest banks. It was almost crashing. Tom took over, he called in McKinsey. McKinsey helped him restructure it. This McKinsey said, you need to look at your culture. We recommend the Barrett method. And so we called in in 2005, we measured the culture of the organization. And here you see the current culture, entropy at 25%. It's significant, but it's not, you know, it's not going to go bankrupt. And every year thereafter, these are the top 10 values that we measured. And so there were three matching values between current and desired in 2005 with 25% entropy. The next year, entropy went down to 19%. Matching values went up from four between current and desired. The following year, entropy went down to 17%. The following year, down to 14%. Now there are five matching values between current and desired. 13%, 13%, 11%. We've just done it for this year, down to 10% entropy. And what happened, of course? Well, guess what? Uh, this is the drop in entropy. These are the number of responses. See, the, you're not forced to do this survey in, in NetBank, but what people found was is if they did the survey, leadership took note of the results and started changing things. So year by year, the number of respondents. So this is why I think I'm promoting in my love, fear, and the destiny of nations, this methodology for mapping the values of nations, because if people can see that the national political leaders are taking attention to the results of a values assessment, more and more people are going to re-engage with the political system. Because let's say nothing about our political leaders and their levels of consciousness, that has to change too. But when people are to participate in a meaningful way, I mean, I participate, I participate in democracy once every four years for 10 minutes when I vote. For me, that is not democracy. And I don't believe it's democracy for anybody. That's why we're all disengaged with democracy. And when we see the levels of consciousness of our leaders, man, talk about focus on self-esteem, status. Where are the values of the common good in our political leaders? They're not there. They're serving their interests. They're the new elites. We got rid of kings and queens, and then we got politicians. Democracy needs to change significantly. This is, the, uh, this is how staff engagement, there was a dip in 2010, I'm not quite sure why, but then it's climbing up again as entropy went down. This was a dip in the, uh, you see a dip in 2008 in the share price, that was due to the global financial crisis, it's going heading back up again. This is the revenue, you see how revenue increases again, a dip at 2008. But basically what we have found time after time, and you can go to our website and see lots of case studies, valuescenter.com. Um, basically, as entropy goes down and the values alignment goes up, every positive indicator, staff engagement, income, everything, climbs. 
Okay, so what is a leadership values assessment? Is basically, um, what I'm saying here is the culture of an organization is a reflection of the leader's values. So here on the left, you've got the culture of an organization with 38% entropy and the top 10 values, all except one, are limiting values. We actually measured this. And then we mapped the values of the leader. So 15 people went online and said what, you know, what the values of the leader were, and the leader went online and did his own values assessment. But the result of some of the uh, 14 uh, assessors, you see all of the limiting values that they see in the leader. So it's no surprise that the leader's values are reflected in the culture. Now here's exactly the opposite. Here's a positive valor, organizational cultural values assessment, and there you see the values of the leader. So 7% entropy in the organization, Personal entropy, that's the proportion of votes for limiting values that assessors see in the leader, personal entropy is 9%. So imagine if you, can, if you can actually measure the entropy of a leader year by year, you can say, well, okay, what happened this year? Or, well done. Because we need measurement to be able to help people move forward. Otherwise, it's just my opinion against your opinion. So we've done this, uh, we, we've do, we won't bother going there. We, that's the, these are the levels of personal entropy. You, ha you have this on your stick. And this is a, so this is an example of a plot. So you go online and as a leader and you say, these are my top 10, you pick 10 values about who you are. You pick your strengths, what you need to work on, etc. And then you invite 15 of your closest colleagues to do the same. It's 360 or whatever. Uh, and they also pick and what you need to work on, which forms part of the written report. But here you see the results of uh, three partners, Jeff Vader. So Jeff, you see, has got a high set of values. That's how Jeff sees himself, but um, the people he works with see him in pretty much the same way. You can see that immediately from the dot plot, and you've got five matching values between the two. Now, this is his brother in the same business, Jim Vader. Now, People see Jim exactly the same way they see Jeff, but Jim doesn't see himself that way. He's got less sense of knowing who he is. So this is good news for Jim. Jim, time to step up. Step up to who you really are, because look, look how people see you. Now, we've got the third member of this trio. It's a really a trio. I've just changed the name. We've got Darth Vader. <laughs> now, let me read out the values that Darth says about himself. He says, ambitious, courageous, creativity, excellence, integrity, long-term perspective, passion, results, strategic lines, and vision. My, that is a great set of values for somebody starting a company, right? Hey, you might, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna dominate the world with that set of values. But how do you, how do people who work with you feel about that? Oh, well, uh, authoritarian, competitive, demanding, power, all these limiting values showing up. So again, you know, so the feedback to Darth Vader is simple. You know, it's like, Darth, brilliant set of values. You're going to get places, but you're not taking your people with you. And that's going to, in the end, that's going inhabit to your, inhibit your performance. So one of your brothers might be better at running the organization while, and dealing with people while you look after the promotion. It's time to make the evolution of consciousness conscious. Okay, good.